العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أما بعد. Uh, we're still talking about the first few days of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's arrival in uh, Medina, and uh, today we're going to talk about the two masjids that he built in a little bit more detail and some of the benefits we can derive uh, from them and the very first Salat al Jum'ah and other things that happen in the very first few days. Uh, we already mentioned that there's a controversy over when exactly the Prophet arrived in Medina. And the fact of the matter is we do not know the date with precision for one simple reason. People did not concern themselves with dates that much. It was a very different time and place and the importance of what exact date it happened on was not that important. So we have a spectrum of opinions. Uh, 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal is commonly put, but the fact of the matter is that it seems too many things happen on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal and academically it doesn't make uh, sense. Because one early book of history mentions that the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca on the 1st of Rabi' al-Awwal. And uh, for him to have left Mecca on the first of Rabi' al-Awwal, the average time it took to get from Mecca to Medina or from Medina to Mecca was in those days, uh, a rider could do it, a very quick rider could do it in three and a half days if they were going at very fast pace. And if they're doing it very slow caravan, they might take up to nine days, right? So between three and a half to nine days, it doesn't make sense then that the Prophet is coming on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, even if we put in uh, maybe two nights in Ghari Thawr. Again, we don't know exactly how many nights he was in Ghari Thawr. Some say two, some say three. So a date of 8th or 9th of Rabi' al-Awwal actually makes more sense. A date of 8th or 9th of Rabi' al-Awwal makes more sense. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that he arrived on a Monday, and we know from the reports that he arrived basically before high noon. Because remember the report said, this is, we have derived it. The report said that when the news reached Medina, now pause here, here. The fact that the news reaches Medina that the Prophet has left means at least three and a half, four days have already happened. Because the fastest rider from Mecca to Medina will take three to four days, right? So the news has arrived before the Prophet arrived because he's taking slower and he's also staying some nights in Ghari Thawr, correct? So the news has arrived. They are then coming every morning to meet the Prophet ﷺ, waiting for him to come. And eventually when the sun gets too hot, what time does the sun get too hot? Around 10.30, 11 o'clock. Right? This is when the sun gets too hot in Medina, uh, in any desert climate, basically around 10, 11 o'clock. You know, because the people, they would wake up at the crack of dawn, you understand, this was the good old days. Literally, you know, 5 a.m. they're awake, 6 a.m. they're awake and they're doing their stuff. So they have delegations waiting. Groups of people waiting, when will the Prophet arrive? And by 11, maybe around 11 or so, they would have to come back. So, the Prophet arrived probably a little bit before noon or maybe a little bit after noon. Again, we don't know exactly when, but a time when the people had already gone back home. So, he comes in on a Monday. And this was when the Sahaba went out to greet him. We already said the farthest settlement of Medina was Quba. This was the first settlement of the large city of Medina. The Medina is composed of small little uh, little um, encampments, if you like, right? Small little mini villages. The smallest one of them, and the farthest, sorry, the farthest one of them in the direction of Mecca is, Medi uh, is Quba. So the Prophet ﷺ arrives in what is now called Quba, and he stays at the house of uh, Kulthum ibn Hidim. Kulthum ibn Hidim. Uh, somebody asked me last week who did the Prophet stay at, so I looked up a number of books. It's Kulthum ibn Hidim, uh, and we don't have any information about him other than the fact that he was an elderly man from the tribe of Banu Amr ibn Auf, which is one of the tribes of the Ansar, and he died. He was, in fact, the first Sahabi to die in Medina. So, subhanAllah, Allah blessed him to host the Prophet ﷺ, and then he became the first Muslim to die in Medina after uh, the Prophet ﷺ arrived because of his age. So, this, yani Allah has basically saving him to that time to host the Prophet ﷺ. We wish we had more details. We can only imagine uh, what his life would have been like, but clearly Allah had something great stored for him, that he allowed him to live right up till the time the Prophet ﷺ came, he hosted him, and then the next thing we know is that the first Muslim to die in Medina was Kulthum ibn Hidim. That's the only thing we know about the Sahabi uh, Kulthum. By the way, Kulthum uh, is sometimes the name of a woman and sometimes the name of a man. This Kulthum here is the name of a man. Uh, it is also said that the Prophet ﷺ stayed in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, but some reports say that 
No, he would spend the night at the house of Kulthum, and because Kulthum was a married man with children, he would go to the house of Sa'ad, who was a bachelor. And so in this house, guests could come without any problem. So he would spend the day in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, and people would come visit him, and then he would spend the night in the house of Kulthum ibn uh, Hidim. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an sp stayed in the house of another of the Ansar. And the next day, the Prophet began building the first uh, masjid in Medina, which is, of course, the first masjid that he built. There was uh, an area that the Muslims would pray in, not a physical structure of a masjid, but the Sahaba in Medina were already praying regularly before the Prophet arrived, right? So there was already a makeshift masjid, but not a purpose-built masjid, okay? There was already a place there. Jumu'ah had already begun. The first Jumu'ah had already taken place in Medina. Mus'ab ibn Umair is there, right? The Prophet has not yet prayed Jumu'ah even once in his life. And this shows us the commandment for Jumu'ah is one of those few incidents the Sahaba did it before the Prophet The commandment for Jumu'ah, the Sahaba did it before the Prophet Because the Prophet sent a message to them from Makkah that established the Jumu'ah. But he could not do it because he's being persecuted, because there is no freedom in Makkah. So he sends a message to the people of Medina. They start Jumu'ah for probably a, a year or less than a year until the Prophet comes and then he arrives in, uh, on a Monday, uh, he begins building uh, the masjid, which is now called Masjid uh, Quba, and it is said that uh, by the time he began building, Ali radiallahu anh had already arrived at, as well, which means that he did not begin building the masjid for at least two to three days, because reports say that Ali arrived around two to three days after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is because Ali radiallahu anhu remained in Mecca, according to Ibn Ishaq, for three more nights. After the Prophet ﷺ left, he remained for three more nights, uh, basically concluding the affairs of the Prophet ﷺ, getting rid of the amanat, as we said, handing them back to their people. And so Ali and the Prophet ﷺ, therefore, were both uh, on their en route to Medina, but the Prophet ﷺ was ahead of him. But he started before him, and he took a longer path. Right? Two things to keep in mind. The Prophet ﷺ started before Ali by three days. He stayed some nights in Ghari Thawr, and then he took a longer path. So all of this basically meant that Ali caught up with the Prophet ﷺ basically as if they left three days at the same time. Right? So this means that Ali took the quicker route, the faster route, i.e. the main route. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ went to Ghari Thawr, and then he took the longer route, and then he waited for Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, to come to Medina. And Ali most likely arrived on the Wednesday or Thursday, and then on Friday morning, according to Ibn Ishaq, they, they set out for the city of Medina. So this means that Masjid Quba was begun to be built on the Wednesday or Thursday. And it is said that the first stone was put by the Prophet ﷺ, and Ali and Abu Bakr continued, and then the Ansar took over from there. So the first pillar or the first stone that was put from Masjid Quba was put by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, there's a little bit of a controversy in the books of Tafsir about a reference in the Quran, Surah Tawbah verses 108 to 110. Surah Tawbah verses 108 to 110. This, uh, these sex selection of verses, the Prophet is being told, you're not allowed to pray in the Masjid Dirar. The masjid of the munafiqeen, the masjid of the hypocrites. لا تقوم فيه أبدا. Never pray there. We're going to come to the story later on what happened and why was the Prophet ﷺ told never to pray there. This is the masjid of Ubay ibn Khalaf and all of these, uh, uh, sorry, Ubay, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn, ibn Khalaf, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul uh, and the other of the munafiqeen. The Prophet ﷺ is told by Allah, do not pray there. لا تقوم فيه أبدا. Then, Allah tells him, rather than praying here, لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَقُومَ فِيهِ Verily, the masjid that was built upon taqwa from the very first day, this has more right that you pray in it, rather than the masjid of al-munafiqoon. فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَّرُوا In this masjid are those Men who love to purify themselves, Wallahu yuhibbul muttahirin, that Allah loves those who purify themselves. Now, which masjid is being referred to? That the masjid that whose foundation was built upon taqwa, it is more appropriate that you pray there. 
One opinion, and this is the majority opinion, says that this is the Masjid of Quba. Because the Masjid of Munafiqun was in the same vicinity as the Masjid of Quba. And so the Prophet is being told, don't go to that, go to this Masjid. And if this is the case, and it is the correct opinion, inshaAllah, then this is a direct reference, I should say indirect because it's not mentioned, an indirect reference to Masjid of Quba. And the Prophet would pray in Quba every week. Every week he would pray there. Ali ibn Abi Talib says every single week the Prophet would either walk or ride his camel to Quba. He would go there as a weekly ritual, usually on Mondays it is said. He would go there and he would pray two rak'at and he said whoever does wudu from his house and prays in Masjid Quba, he will get the reward of a full Umrah. So Masjid Quba has a blessing uh, and once we get to Medina we also pray in Masjid Quba. Now, Allah says that masjid that was built upon taqwa has more right that you stand in it. In one hadith in Abu Dawood, we are told that this is Masjid Quba. And when this verse was revealed, they asked the people of Quba, why did Allah praise you in a manner that He doesn't praise us? فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَّرُوا In it are men who wish to purify themselves. So this is mentioned in the Kitab al-Tahara, the book of Tahara and the Adab of Tahara. So the men said uh, that with regards to purifying themselves after using the restroom, they have a practice that they had that they would wipe themselves and then wash it with water. Whereas most of the people at the time would only wipe themselves and they would not use water. So they said we always cleanse ourselves with water as well. And they were told, this is why Allah has said that you are those who love to purify yourself. That this is the better thing to do. To use water every time you go to the restroom. By the way, it is not wajib in the fiqh of tahar. We've talked about this when we've done this. A lot of people have a misconception that you must use water. No, none of the scholars of Islam ever said this. You do not have to use water uh, when you go to the restroom, uh, either for urine or for uh, defecation, akramakumullah. You don't need to use it for either. It's better to do so. But you may use dry material, and in fact, most of the people of the past didn't have the luxury of using so much water. Not that they couldn't, meaning they would die, but it is something that was difficult for them. So they didn't do so. So the people of Quba did. And so Allah Azza wa Jal praises them in this manner and this shows us that it is better. Alhamdulillah, our culture and custom has uh, basically encouraged us to do this and this is very Islamic that we do use water. The point being, la masjidun usis ala taqwa from this hadith is, is which masjid? Quba. Now, where's the problem? A sahabi came to the Prophet and reported in Tirmidhi Mustadim Amhal and he said, Ya Rasulullah, which is the masjid that is usis ala taqwa min awwal yawm an ahaqqa an taqwa fi? Direct question. So the Prophet said that indeed, wallahi, it is this masjid of mine. Innahu la masjidi hadha. This hadith is also authentic. Tirmidhi, right? So this is where the Ikhtilaf comes amongst the scholars then. Which masjid is being referred to in the Quran that Allah says, La masjidun usis ala taqwa min awwal yawm in ahaqwa antaquma fi? Another group said it's not Quba, it is the Prophet's masjid. The reconciliation is, in fact, the ayah applies to both masjids in that both of them were made upon taqwa from their first day. And the Prophet said, that this is my masjid so that nobody thinks that the masjid of Quba has a higher blessing than his masjid because it doesn't. So he's saying this also applies to my masjid and not just to masjid Quba. Because both masjids were built upon taqwa from the first day. Right? So the reconciliation is that the verse applies to both but it is also a reference to uh, so on Friday morning, we said that, so the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Quba the rest of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, on fr and he announced on Thursday night that he will enter Medina the next morning. So the preparations are made, and the Ansar, over 500 of them, dressed up as we already said, and they, and they uh, wore their ceremonial costumes, their, uh, their armor and their, uh, their knives, because this is how they would dress up in the time, to welcome and greet the Prophet wasallam and to come with him back into the city. So there is a proper welcoming committee to bring him to the center of the city of Medina, and on Friday morning, he وسلم, leaves Quba and Salat al-Jum'ah occurs in the middle. 
So, the first Jumu'ah that the Prophet ﷺ prayed was neither in Quba nor he doesn't yet have a masjid, right? He doesn't yet have a masjid. He's on his way. He actually prays it in the tribe of Banu Salama region. He just stops over there and he gives the, the first khutbah. And this khutbah has been recorded by Ibn Ishaq and Al-Bayhaqi with a slightly weak chain. Uh, and there's no haraj or there's no problem in narrating it. The first khutbah that the Prophet ﷺ ever gave it has been recorded uh, in Ibn Ishaq. And as we are familiar with, there are two sections of it. And what is really amazing, and in fact, all of the khutbas of the Prophet ﷺ that we have recorded, and we have only a few of them, wallahi, they do not last more than three to five minutes. And it's very interesting. The khutbas of the Prophet ﷺ were extremely short. Three to five minutes, right? This is how it was. And the Prophet ﷺ said, it is from the fiqh, which means understanding or completion or perfection of a man, that he shortens the khutbah and lengthens the salah. So in fact, his salah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was longer than his khutbah. His salah was longer than his khutbah. Subhanallah. In our times, of course, we have done the opposite. And the fact of the matter is that there is a reason that we do this. And the reason is that this is the only time 90% of the ummah ever sees the inside of the masjid. In fact, to be brutally honest, it is the only time 70% of the ummah even prays in the week. So because of this, we kind of sort of, and this is the sunnah around the world. I mean, I don't know of any major masjid that has a khutbah for three minutes anymore. Right? It's really, it's something that, um, you know, the Prophet was speaking to people, their iman was at a different level. And they did not need the reminders that we need. Right? So this is one of those uh, things that the ummah has kind of sort of had to change, but still we try to keep it reasonable. 25 minutes I think is a very reasonable time for a khutbah, and this is what most of the messages in this land do. Sometimes in many lands it goes 45, and I know of some messages they used to have an hour-long khutbah in, in, in the eastern part of the world, an hour-long khutbah, and that's clearly going too far. Nonetheless, the Prophet ﷺ's khutbah, what is the first khutbah? The first khutbah that he gave, two parts, the first part of it, he encouraged them to be generous and he reminded them of the certainty of death and of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah azza wa jal would ask each and every one of them about what he had been given and what he spent with what he had been given. And in this khutbah there is a phrase that is a part of an authentic hadith that we all know. And that is, and this hadith is in Bukhari, not the khutbah, the phrase that he said in the khutbah. And that is, that whoever is able to save himself from the fire... Even if with half a date, walaw bi shiqqi tamra, right? And shiqh doesn't actually even mean half, it means with the, the seed or the pith of the date. Walaw bi shiqqi tamra, even with a portion of the uh, tamra, let him do so. And if he doesn't even have this, then with kalima tayyibah, with a good word, because every deed is multiplied ten times. Then he sat down. That's the first khutbah. Charity, death, meeting Allah, hisab, and Give sadaqah, and if you can't give sadaqah, speak something good. First khutbah. Second khutbah, he stood up. And, now this is what Ibn Ishaq reports, and it's contrary to what we are used to, and Allah knows best. In the second khutbah, he began with what is called the khutbah tul haja. And that is what all of us, including myself, began the first khutbah with. Inna alhamdulillah. نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْهُ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمَّا بَعْد And then he started the second khutbah. So he started with khutbah al haja in the second khutbah. But from other riwayat, we learn that he would usually start the khutbah al haja in the first khutbah. So perhaps this changed later on. But this is what Ibn Ishaq reports. Or perhaps the two have been mixed around, but that's not something anybody has said uh, before. So Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And then he said, after he said, Amma ba'd. And then he said, the successful one is the one whom Allah has beautified his heart. Zayyanahu, zayyana lahu qalbuh. His heart has become beautiful. This is the successful one. And has caused him to enter Islam after leaving kufr. This is the successful person. And has chosen him above the rest of the people for the best of all matters. I.e., you who have accepted Islam have been blessed like no one else on earth. 
You have succeeded because you left kufr and entered Islam. Love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And love Allah with your entire heart. وَأَحِبُّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ قَلْبِكُمْ بِكُلِّ قَلْبِ uh, The entire heart. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. And never tire of the speech of Allah and of the dhikr of Allah. Never get tired of the speech of Allah. كَلَامُ اللَّهِ وَذِكْرُهُ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ is the Qur'an. The dhikr is his remembrance. And never let your heart become hard. Allah chooses what He wishes and what He blesses. And He has blessed this, meaning the Qur'an and the dhikr, to be the best deed. Allah chooses whatever He pleases and He has chosen this, meaning Al-Qur'an with dhikr, kalamullahi wa dhikruhu, to be the best deed. So worship Allah and do not associate partners with Him and have taqwa of Him as He said that you should and be sincere to Allah in all that you say. Love one another with the spirit of Allah between you. This is a phrase that I have not found in any other hadith. بِرُوحِ اللَّهِ بَيْنَكُمْ أَحِبُّ اللَّهَ بِرُوحِ اللَّهِ بَيْنَكُمْ Right? It's a very interesting phrase. And it's a phrase that the Prophet ﷺ said in the first khutbah. Love Allah with the ruh Allah, with the spirit of Allah Azza wa Jal between you. And remember that Allah hates that His promise be broken. وَالسَّلَامُ alaykum. This is the entire khutbah, which I gave in less than three minutes translation with explanation. If I didn't have the explanation, it'd probably be two, two minutes or so. This is the entire khutbah that we have. And subhanAllah, look at uh, how comprehensive this khutbah and how pertinent it is. The first khutbah is all about charity. And what a great time to remind people of charity because now the ummah needs charity. If there was any time that we needed to fundraise, it was at the beginning of Islam, right? If there was any time people need to donate, for the cause of Allah, it was right at the beginning of Islam. And so the first khutbah is about, you guys need to give your money now. We're going to have to start an entire new republic, a new system. We will need your sacrifices. So he encourages them. He reminds them of the reality of life and the certainty of death. This short khutbah has both threats and rewards. It has hopes and promises. And this is the way of Islam. That we... we, we Tell people the rewards of Allah to make them feel happy and joyful. But we also make them scared of the fearful punishment of Allah. Right? Targhib and tarhib is the Arabic phrase. Right? We give them hope and we also make them scared of Allah's punishment. This is the methodology of Islam. Some other major religions of our times find this to be backward. And for them it's all about the good side, the lovey side. Right? But the fact of the matter is that human nature needs the carrot and the stick. The carrot is good. But unless you have a stick, it'll not always move along, right? You need both, the reward and the punishment. And our religion of Islam, the Quran is full of promises of Jannah and threats of punishment. Because human nature is like this, you need both. And even in this khutbah, you will be meeting Allah, so fear Him. Death is going to come to you. Allah will ask you about your money, about what you have been given, the surplus. So if you can f save yourself from the fire of hell, this is the first khutbah He's saying. Makes you feel very scared. And then there's also love Allah with your full heart, right? Allah will give you what He promised, etc. So there's both threats and uh, promises. Also notice that uh, the, the Muslims are being told, oh by the way, the khutbatul hajjah, by the way, is its own topic. Wallah, we can talk 30 minutes just about the khutbatul hajjah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. This is so eloquent. It's such a beautiful and concise speech. Verily, all praise is due to Allah. And only Allah is worthy of being praised. Therefore, we praise Him. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu. Following the commandment. We will praise Him. And nasta'inuhu, we will ask for his help. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Right? Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. We're praising Allah and worshipping him. Nasta'inuhu. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our deeds and the consequences of our souls. Verily, whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide. Whomever Allah misguides, no one can guide him back to the straight path. I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This is khutbatul hajjah. This khutbah is so powerful that people accepted Islam just because of this khutbah. Just because of this khutbah, they accepted Islam. And the most famous example is that of uh, Dhimad al-Azdi. Dhimad al-Azdi came to Mecca, and he was from the leaders of the tribes of Yemen, and he was a medicine man. And when he entered Mecca, the people told him, 
beware of this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is a sahir or a majnoon or one of these things. Right? Be careful of him. So, the mad said, I put cotton in my ears to make sure that I don't hear what he says. Because they warned me so much, I became terrified. So I put cotton in my ears every time he's, I see him so that I don't hear him. Then I said to myself that I am Rajul Aqil, I'm an intelligent man. I mean, how powerful can his speech be? If he's wrong, I'll, misguide him, I'll guide him. If he's sick, I'm a medicine man, I'll cure him, right? What's the problem? So he took the cotton out and he walked up to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, your people have warned me about you, but I want to listen to what you have to say. So the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَنَسْيَأَةَ عَنْ مَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ فَلَا وَمِذْ رَبْ وَشْهَدُ وَلَّا إِلَى رَشْمَ رَسُولُهُ Then he said, أَمَّا بَعْدِ He was going to begin the speech. Dhimad said, قِفْ أَعِدْ عَلَيِّ كَلِمَاتَكَ هَدِ Repeat these words that you just said. So the Prophet ﷺ repeated the entire speech. He hasn't even begun the lecture. This is khutbatul haja. And Dhimad said that I have memorized the shi'r of the ins and the jinn. I've memorized the poetry of everyone out there. And I consider myself an intelligent and an and, and educated man. But wallahi, I have never heard anything as eloquent as this. By Allah, you must be a man whom Allah inspires. And khalas, he accepted Islam right then and there. Khutbatul haja caused Dhimad al-Azdi to accept Islam, right? This is how eloquent the Khutbatul Hajjah is and it is worthy of its own uh, lecture and people have written books about it. Ibn Taymiyyah has a treatise on ex explaining Khutbatul Hajjah. Ibn Qayyim has many pages in his explanation of Sunan Abi Dawud about Khutbatul Hajjah. In our times, uh, Shaykh al-Albani has written an entire booklet about Khutbatul Hajjah and its uh, report. So it's a topic worthy in itself. Then after the Khutbatul Hajjah, he reminds them, it's purely spiritual. The second, the first is action-based. We need you to be charitable. The second is purely spiritual. And this is subhanAllah, the perfection of Islam. That it's both, both iman and amal, if you like, right? It's both spirituality and action-based. And again, the perfection of the two khutbas. So the Prophet ﷺ tells them, what is the real success? What is the beauty of Islam? He tells them to purify their hearts. That love Allah Azza wa Jal with your entire heart. Have nothing but love for Allah Azza wa Jal. He tells them of two basic acts of worship that he says never get tired of doing them. SubhanAllah, the first khutbah in Medina. What is he telling the Muslims to do? Number one, never get tired of reading the Quran. Number two, never get tired of doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of us should have to this day, or subhanAllah, this is what he said to the first, we should have a healthy dose every day of Quran and dhikr. This is hand in hand. He said, don't, he's commanding us, don't get tired. Then he's encouraging us that Allah chooses whatever he wants. And Allah has chosen these to be the best worship. Right? Allah has chosen these. So, do not get tired of them and do not make your heart hard. Which means, reading the Quran and doing dhikr will make the heart soft. Because he's saying, do not make the heart hard. After he's saying, recite the Quran and do dhikr. Uh, and he concludes them, and he concludes the khutbah by reminding them to love one another. Again, a very necessary reminder at the beginnings of Islam, especially that love one another biruhillah, with the ruh of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this means with the help of Allah, this means yani, in the spirit of Islam, this means for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he then finishes by saying that Allah Azza wa Jal does not love that his promises are broken, which is an indirect threat that you have a promise to Allah as Muslims now to fulfill his religion. Make sure you don't break that promise. You have a promise to fulfill his religion. Make sure that you do not fulfill that, uh, that break that uh, promise. And then after this khutbah, he then entered Medina. And from there, we already mentioned uh, what happened where the camel, uh, you know, sat down at the place of the masjid. And he asked whose house was the closest. He stayed at Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. All of this has been uh, mentioned. And the first thing, therefore, he did was once again turn his attention to building the masjid. So notice in the span of Literally five days, the Prophet has built two masjids and he doesn't even have a roof over his head yet. Literally two masjids have been built and the third one, which is basically where he stopped over, they built a masjid there after him, right? 
So there's a third indirect masjid, right? He didn't build it there, but where he stopped to pray Jum'ah, that also then became the masjid for that locality. By the way, there were many masajid in Medina at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, because people could not walk to central Medina, you know, an hour and, and a half or, or something away for some of them. They couldn't walk to every salah uh, to the central, uh, you know, Medina. So they would have, you know, small masajid in their own little places. And therefore, do realize, many people imagine there was one masjid. No. There were at least a dozen masjids in the settlement eventually, at least a dozen if not more. But the Prophet's masjid of course was the central and it was the largest one. And it appears to have been uh, the only one in which Jumu'ah was done and Allah knows best. It appears that Jumu'ah was only done there. There are no reports as far as I remember of any other uh, Jumu'ahs taking place. So we see therefore the importance of the masjid. The masjid even before his house sallallahu and this shows us the status of this house of Allah Azza wa Jal. It shows us that this house of Allah, these houses of Allah, and in fact Allah calls them His houses. Fi buyutin adin Allah. Allah calls the masjids His houses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the masjid in the Quran. Fi buyutin adin Allah an turfa'a wa yudhkara fi hasmuhu. Yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghudwi wal asali rijal. That in houses of worship, Allah has encouraged and allowed that people raise their voices in praising Him and in glorifying Him. And people, rijal, it's a praise. Men are glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in morning and in evening. They are not dissuaded away from this. They are not tempted away from this with their wealth and their, uh, and their uh, other distractions from the worship of Allah throughout the morning and the evening. Uh, the masjid was the place of ilm. This is where halaqat would be given. The masjid was the place of shura. This is where the Prophet ﷺ called the sahaba in the battle of Badr, in the battle of Uhud. He's calling them. What do you think we should do? It's basically the, the, the uh, constitution place as well. It's the place where people come together and decide affairs. The masjid is socialization. The people would socialize over there. The Prophet ﷺ would ask them about their days of jahiliyyah and they would laugh and joke inside the masjid. The masjid was a place of celebration. Their nikahs would take place in the masjid. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ was in his masjid more than he was in his own house. He was in the masjid more than he was in his own house. And this shows us the status of the masjid. From it, ilm spread. From it, the Qur'an spread. From it, even the armies of Islam spread. Because they would be arranged inside the masjid. And then they would go out from there. And in it, those who had no house would sleep. As soon as Muslims came, they would be housed in the masjid. As soon as they came, if they had no house, the masjid became their house. And the Prophet ﷺ said his authentic hadith that Al Masjidu Baytu Kulli Taqi, that the masjid is the house of every muttaqi. The masjid is the house of every muttaqi. Anyone who is a Muslim, the masjid should be open for them to come and worship. And if they need to sleep, then uh, yeah, and the scholars, of course, technically have talked about this. Is it is it wajib to give them space or whatnot? But basically, the general rule of Islam is that. Uh, a Muslim who needs a place to sleep, the masjid will become his place to sleep. Because that's what the Prophet said, Al Masjidu Baytu Kulli Taqi. That has a double meaning, by the way. The masjid will be the house of every muttaqi, which means the muttaqi will want to be in the masjid. This is the other meaning, right? Where do you feel most comfortable? Your house. So where is the muttaqi most comfortable? His house. But the other meaning, which is the physical meaning, there is a spiritual meaning. The other meaning is every Muslim who doesn't have a house, the masjid becomes his house because it is the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. And of course, the masjid of the Prophet literally became a university and a house and a masjid all in one for the people of the Sufa, Ahl Sufa. And we'll talk about the Ahl Sufa and who they are and what their blessings were in inshallah next week. Now the five daily salawat had already been, uh, oh I forgot to mention one story by the way, I didn't forget but time ran out when the Prophet was building the masjid. We mentioned that the Prophet himself uh, participated in building the masjid and uh, when the Sahaba saw him, they said that wallahi, and they, this is a verse, this is a poem, they said wallahi if we sit down and the Prophet is working, then this from us is a very astray uh, matter. They versified a poem that if we sit down, that if we sit down and the Prophet is working, this is a very shameful and misguided thing from us and this encouraged them to worship. 
One incident is narrated here that has a uh, deep theological and historical uh, importance that we don't have time to go into in detail now or even for the seerah because this is after the seerah, after the death of the Prophet And that relates to Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir, remember from the days of uh, Mecca, Ammar ibn Yasir, both his mother and father had become uh, shaheed. The first two shaheeds in Islam are Yasir and Sumayya. And so Ammar, uh, you know, grows up basically uh, an orphan. Um, and he immigrates to Medina. And he is carrying two large bricks. Two large bricks. And his entire body has been dusted cover to cover. And he says to the Prophet, everybody else was carrying one. When I say brick, it's not like our little bricks here, right? These are the old bricks or the old, you can call them quarry stones, maybe is a better word, not a brick, right? These are big stones. So he's carrying two stones and he's struggling with it. And he says, and in my opinion, this is like a joking thing to say, in that he didn't mean it seriously. He said, Ya Rasulullah, they're killing me by giving me two stones and they're taking only one, right? Now he's not serious that they're actually killing him, but it's like a thing that you say in a joking manner, and this shows us that the Sahaba had a sense of humor with the Prophet as well, right? That, they're say, that he said, Ya Rasulullah, yaqtulunani. They're killing me by giving me two stones, and they're only carrying one stone, right? And this shows us that they would joke with him. It also shows us, by the way, fiqh here, that when it comes to these types of jokes, somebody would say, La hawla wa quwwata billah, you're lying. No, look, a joke is understood to be a joke. Right? It's not a lie if the person knows that you're not, it's a joke. Right? And there are instances of uh, the Prophet also cracking jokes, and we'll talk about that some, you know, we talked about it before a little bit, we can talk more about that maybe towards the end of the seerah. Of course, the Prophet's jokes even literally were true, by the way. Right? Whereas Ammar is using a figure of speech here, they're killing me. يَقْتُلُونَنِي And it, it shows a little bit of exaggeration, shows his um, sense of humor, also shows his young age for him to say this, right? So what did the Prophet do? He smiled and he brushed the dust off of him. And he said, لَا يَبْنَ Sumayya. No, O son of Sumayya, they are not killing you. Rather, the people who shall kill you will be الْفِئَةُ الْبَاغِيَةِ will be the, uh, it's a very tense sensitive thing to translate here, because of course it refers specifically to a group of Muslims that we also respect. And that's why we need to not go too deep in it because we don't have time. Al-Fi'atul Baghiya means the group that has gone beyond the bounds. And he called him Yabna Sumayya, even though his name is Ammar, right? To give honor to his mother Sumayya, subhanAllah. His name is Ammar. But he gives honor to the first shaheed in Islam was Sumayyah, before even Yasser was Sumayyah. The first shaheed was Sumayyah, right? So he gave honor to Ammar by calling him La Yabna Sumayyah. And forever afterwards, the Sahaba would call him Yabna Sumayyah. Because the Prophet called him, he was not even called Ammar after this. He was called Yabna Sumayyah. Because the Prophet called him Yabna Sumayyah. La Yabna Sumayyah, they're not going to kill you. But rather, the people who will kill you will be the, the group that has gone to over the bounds. That has gone al-baghiya, bagha, means they've gone beyond what they should, right? And he also said to him that, uh, uh, that لِلنَّاسِ أَجْرٌ وَلَكَ أَجْرًا Everybody is getting one reward when they carry their stones. You're getting two rewards with your two stones. And he said to him, وَآخِرُ زَادِكَ شُرْبَةً مِنْ لَبَن The last thing you shall drink in this world will be a glass of milk. Right? SubhanAllah, he predicted the death of Ammar ibn Yasir. He said, you're going to drink some milk, and then the group that is baghiya will kill you. And uh, Ammar ibn Yasir's death became a very uh, important event in Islam, because Ammar chose to fight on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib against the forces of Muawiyah. And Muawiyah's forces, uh, Obviously, as we know, there was a, a war, and so Ali was killed on the side of Ali against Muawiyah. Ammar was killed on the side of Ali, excuse me. Ammar was killed on the side of Ali against Muawiyah, and this hadith then was used by the uh, yani group of Ali to say, the group of Muawiyah has gone beyond the bounds. This is the sign that uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was closer to the truth, and this is the 
Sunni position in this regard, in contrast to what the other group says about us, that we're the followers of Muawiyah, we follow them all. But we think that Ali was closer to the truth than Muawiyah, and Muawiyah was sincere, and radiyallahu anhum, we don't say anything bad about any of them. And of course, by the way, just as a footnote, that I've, now that I brought this up, there were three groups of the Sahaba. One group who did not fight. They sat down and they did not fight and they refused to take sides. And these were the Abadila, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Umar. These were the Abadila. They refused to fight. And they did not get involved with either Ali or Muawiyah. And they were asked multiple times to take part, and they said, no, we are not going to take part. And Ibn Abbas was asked, are you on this, the side of this or the side of that? And it was, it was, at that time, Ali and Aisha were having a little bit of a, a dispute. Are you on the side of Ali? Are you on the team of Ali or the team of Aisha? So he said, I am neither on the team of Ali or the team of Aisha. I am on the team of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Don't get me involved in, in bigotry now. Right? This is hizbiyya, this is ikhtilafat, this is, this is uh, breaking the ummah. I'm not going to take sides with these people. I'm on the side of our Prophet wasallam. And so these Sahaba refused to participate. Ibn Taymiyyah says, this group of Sahaba was on the truth. That was the ideal. Ali was closer to the truth and Muawiyah was not as close as Ali. This is how we say it. right? The three groups were the Abadila and Ali and uh, Muawiyah and Ammar was in the group of Ali and so this and, and of course obviously the Prophet said so uh, it is well known that Ali was drink, uh, sorry that Ammar was drinking some milk and then he went to fight in the battle and he died and so exactly as the Prophet said that Akhiru uh, Zadik the last thing that you will do in this world is to drink some milk and he was sitting in his camp drinking milk and then he went to fight the forces of Muawiyah and an arrow came and killed him and so he died uh, on the side of Ali so this hadith was said at the building of the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this shows us that and nobody denies this within Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had knowledge that the other Sahaba did not have, of course he did. And he predicted certain things that would happen, and this is one of the things that he uh, predicted. So, I didn't mention that story because we didn't have time to mention it. Now moving on to the issue of the masjid and uh, the prayers in the masjid. One thing that we don't know exactly when is the changing of the raka'at of the five salawat. Now, when were the five salawat decreed? We all know. When were they decreed? Isra wal Mi'raj, right? And most likely this occurred maybe the uh, 10th year, 11th year of the Hijrah, uh, of the Da'wah, excuse me, of the Da'wah. So people are praying five times a day. However, at that time, they were praying two rak'at. Every single one of those five was two rak'at. Aisha tells us when they came to Medina, the salawat were placed as you know them, and the two raka'at was kept for the musafir. Except for Maghrib, of course, but otherwise we pray two raka'at. This is Aisha's hadith in Bukhari. When they came to Medina, the salawat were put as you know them, and the two were kept for the musafir. This shows us, therefore, that sometime early on, again, we don't have a date, we don't know when. Sometime early on, the, sah the Sahaba, the Prophet started praying as we now know it, right? Two, four, four, three, four, right? So all of the Salah were increased except for, uh, even Maghrib, by the way, apparently was two in Mecca. So everything was increased except for Fajr that remained two. And then the Sunnah and, and the Nawafil were added. We also know that within, within the first month or two, the question arose, how was the time for prayer to be given. And this is a famous hadith in uh, portions of it are Bukhari and more details in other books of hadith. And everyone knows the story, but in summary, just to put it in its context, the Prophet ﷺ called the Sahaba and they said, and he asked them, how should we call the people at the time of the Salah? What is your idea? And so they started discussing what should be done. One of them said, let us use a bell like the Christians. But this was discarded. And there are authentic hadith that the Prophet did not like bells, and that he also said the angels do not accompany any caravan that has a bell. 
So he didn't like bells. Others said, let us use a chauffeur. Not a chauffeur, a car chauffeur. A chauffeur is what the Yehud use, right? It's a horn. They call it a chauffeur. Uh, the what? Not a, not a bugle, but there's a, it's a horn. They call it a chauffeur. Uh, it's spelled different, by the way, not car chauffeur. It spells, they, 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 they blow into it, and that is how they call it. To this day, of course, that's what they do. One of them said this, but also this was discarded. And others gave other ideas, but no, no idea basically made sense. So the meeting uh, finished without any idea being chosen. That night, two people saw a dream. One of them was Umar ibn al-Khattab. The other was Abdullah ibn Zayd. And their dreams were the same, that Abdullah ibn Zayd, saw in his dream a man selling uh, some items, either the horn or the bell or something. So he went up to him and said, can I buy these items? So the man said, why? So he said, because the Prophet wants to tell us how to call the people to prayer, so I'm thinking one of these will do the job. So the man said, should I not tell you something better than that? So the Sahabi said, of course. Abdullah said, of course. So he said, when you want to give the uh, time for prayer, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu, and then all the way to the end of the Adhan, right? And then he woke up, and the dream was so vivid in his head, he just put on his, his garments and rushed outside to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the dream that I saw. And he told him the entire dream. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Innaha la ru'ya haqq, insha'Allah, this is a true dream. This is a true dream. And uh, it is clear from the reports that he was hoping to be the mu'adhan. You get that from the sense of the riwayah, that he, because he saw the dream. But subhanAllah, the Prophet gave people different blessings according to what they had. So he has the fadila of seeing the dream. That's Abdullah bin Zayd was the one. Remember the name Abdullah bin Zayd. Somebody asks you where was the adhan legislated? This is the only aspect of our sharia that was legislated by the dream of a sahabi. But its legislation was not the dream, its legislation was the process of saying it is true. Right? We do not base our sharia on dreams. And if the Prophet had not said it's true, we wouldn't have based it on it, right? But the, because the Prophet approved, his approval makes it the sharia. So uh, when Abdullah bin Zayd said this, the Prophet said, Qum ya Bilal, stand up, O Bilal, because you have the loudest voice. And Abdullah bin Zayd, go up with him to the roof of the masjid and tell him every phrase and he'll repeat after you. And so Abdullah bin Zayd said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and Bilal repeated in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And so technically Abdullah bin Zayd did give the first adhan, but except it was to Bilal, right? SubhanAllah, look at this, right? Technically he did give the first adhan because he's saying it before Bilal, but then Bilal is the one who proclaims it to the entire world. And as he's giving the adhan, Umar comes rushing into the masjid without having fully tied his lower garment. <laughs> right? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I saw these phrases in the dream. And so it turns out that he also, I mean I heard these phrases in a dream. That it turns out that he as well had seen the exact same dream. So Allah Azza wa had shown it to multiple of the sahaba and uh, Allah had willed that Abdullah ibn Zayd was the one who, uh, be the one who uh, get the honor of telling it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanAllah, I have uh, tried to think about and, and research and, and uh, uh, ponder over why was the adhan legislated in this manner. Uh, what is the wisdom of the adhan being legislated in this manner and none of the other uh, aspects of the sharia. And... To be honest, I haven't found anybody commenting on this and I don't have any wisdom that I can derive myself. Allah has some wisdom known to him. Why was the adhan legislated in this manner? In the dreams of some of the Sahaba. And I also tried to look up about Abdullah ibn Zayd. And in fact, Ibn Hajar says that this is the Sahabi who is famous for the story of the dream. That's it. <laughs> Circular, right? Well, why did Allah choose Abdullah ibn Zayd? So this is one of the sad parts of the seerah that there are so many mysteries that perhaps we will never know. There must be reasons why this man was chosen, right? What is his story? What did, what did he do for Islam? What is his blessing that Allah made him the one to the Yawm Al-Qiyamah? All that we know about him. As Ibn Hajar says, Sahib Al-Qissa, he's the one of the story of the dream of Adhan. That's how he's known as, 
What else do we know about him? Nothing. Very little. We don't have any real... Because again, most of the Sahaba, the bulk of the Sahaba, we just have tidbits and for someone like this, we have absolutely uh, nothing. Uh, we already said that the Prophet ﷺ built the masjid in around uh, two, two to three weeks. And then after this, he ﷺ built his uh, houses. And at the time, how many wives did he have? One. Which one is that? Three. Three. Which ones are these? Uh, Saudi, Aisha, Aisha, that's a two. So uh, Khadija, so three. So you count Khadija. You're counting Khadija. We're not going to count Khadija. <laughs> two, two. Two, two. two. He had two wives at this time. Sauda and Aisha. And so Sauda and Aisha's houses were built next to the masjid. These were the only two houses that were connected to the masjid. And he married other women later on by a number of years. By a number of years. And by that time, people had already moved in and connected other houses to the masjid. So the Prophet's other wives' houses were in a separate block. They were not in the block next to the masjid. They were not, uh, they didn't have direct entrances, right? And subhanAllah, later on, we don't know exactly when, but uh, Sauda was an elderly lady when the Prophet married her in Mecca. She was already an elderly lady, and uh, she was senior to the Prophet in age. And uh, Sauda wanted to please the Prophet so much that she told him one year, again we don't know exactly, we don't know these things, how are we going to find out what year it happened. One year she told him, Ya Rasulullah, I am an elderly lady, and... Uh, I know that you prefer the company of Aisha, so I will gift you my night for Aisha. So he actually had double the time of Aisha than he had with any other wife because so they gifted uh, her night to him. So what this means is that Aisha was the only house that he lived in that was connected to the masjid. The other wives' houses were on a separate block, a separate, there was a strip. This is what we can understand. There was a strip of houses one after the other on another block that is not connected to the masjid. So this is a blessing of Aisha that she was the only house that was connected uh, to the Prophet and so this as well, but he didn't spend the night there. He would visit Sauda and he would spend time with her in the day, but he would not spend the night with uh, Sauda because she gifted. This was a gift from her. Why did she do this? Because she wants to please the Prophet Right? She wants to get his pleasure, basically. And she knows what's going to please him, so uh, she gifted her night uh, to Aisha. Um, what time is the Adhan today? Nine o'clock. Sakha, so inshallah, uh, let us then open the floor for question and answer, inshallah, and then um, move on next week, inshallah. Next week we'll talk about the concept of a number of things that, that, that happen in early Medina, and each one is very interesting, is very profound, and we have so much to learn from it, even in modern times. Uh, of them is the pairing up of the Ansar and Muhajirun and how we can benefit from this in modern times as well. Of them is, and this is one of the most interesting topics in terms of Islamic political science, the treaty that the Prophet ﷺ drew up between the Ansar and the Muhajirun and the Jews and the pagans. Because there were still pagans, right? The Prophet ﷺ still is in a city where there are Jews and Muslims and pagans. So he has a treaty that gives us an insight into the mechanisms of early Medina, of political, the political structure of Medina. Very profound and it's very groundbreaking for the time. It's very groundbreaking. It's a treaty that, to be honest, it is unprecedented in its scope, in its understanding, uh, and it is one that many later people have kind of adopted and, and taken from. So we're going to talk about the treaty, we're going to talk about the, uh, the uh, pairing up of the Ansar and Muhajirun, and we'll also talk about the concept of the Sufa. All of this will be uh, the next Wednesdays and the Wednesdays after that, inshaAllah ta'ala. We have a few minutes for questions, inshaAllah, before uh, the Salah. You mentioned about the uh, first prayer being uh, increased in Medina. It doesn't talk about Sunnah prayers because some other part of the world, especially people in Nafia and other parts, the different countries and numbers of the Sunnah prayer. What's, what's the most common opinion of that? So the question is about the Sunnah prayers. Uh, so 
the Sunnah prayers can be divided into two categories. The first are the Sunnahs that the Prophet would regularly do. These are called Sunan al Rawatib or Sunan al Ratiba. And these are the ones that he would do as a habit. And these are of two types. The first of them is the Witr prayer. And the correct position is that Witr is not wajib. The Hanafis, of course, consider it to be wajib. And that is because the Hanafis have two distinct categories of Fard and Wajib. Whereas for the rest of the madhabs, Fard is wajib and wajib is Fard. But the Hanafis have seven categories of taklif, right? Uh, seven categories of taklif, uh, whereas the other madhab have five categories. So they divide f obligatory into very obligatory and obligatory, right? Fard and wajib. And they divide haram into uh, makruh, tahrimi, and then haram. Right? So they have two types of makru and then they have haram. So they have makru tanzihi, makru tahrimi, and haram. So uh, because of this, the Hanafis have a different distinction. I'm wondering here, let me get back here. The correct position, witr is not wajib, but it is something that the Prophet never left in his life, even when he was, pra even when he was traveling. Right? Whereas the sunan al ratiba which are the sunan that are linked to the five daily salawat, the Prophet typically left to them when he was traveling, except for the Sunnah of Fajr. So I reiterate, the regular Sunan can be divided into two categories. The first is Witr, which is a separate prayer. And the second are the Sunan linked to the five daily salawat, right? These that are linked to the five daily salawat, when the Prophet would travel, he would not pray them except for the Sunan of Fajr. Now, how many are the Sunan of Rawatib? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever prays for the sake of Allah 10 rak'ahs a day, Allah will build for him a palace in Jannah. And in another version, he said, whoever prays for the sake of Allah 12 rak'ahs a day, then he will build for him a palace in Jannah. So the Sunan of Rawatib are either 10 or 12, and there are both reports of these. So, uh, the first two of these are the Sunan of Fajr. The Sunan of Fajr, right? Then, Zuhar comes, and here is where the difference of 10 or 12 comes. Some say two before Zuhar and two after, and some say four before Zuhar and two after, right? So this is where the difference comes between 10 and 12. So let us go with uh, four before Zuhar and two after, right? So this gives us total of how many? Eight. And then we have two after Maghrib, then we have two after Isha. This would give us a total of 12. Right? Two after Maghrib, two after Isha. Now, these are the Sunan al ratiba that the Prophet would pray when he was Hadar, when he was not Safar. Hadar is the opposite of Safar. When he was not traveling, this is what he would pray, and he would uh, always pray them. Um, the Witr prayer, I have said many times before, in the terminology of the Hadith, Witr is Tahajjud, is basically Taraweeh. It's basically the same concept, and that is the night prayer, right? The night prayer. And the night prayer can be said any time after Isha up until Fajr. You may pray Witr right after Isha before going to sleep. And this is the least rewarding, that if you pray it, you may pray Tahajjud, basically. Tahajjud does not have to be at 3 a.m. It is, of course million times better to pray it at 3, 4 a.m., yes. But if you cannot get to that level of excellence, the next level is to pray it before going to sleep, right? And that is witr as well. Because witr means an odd number of raka'at. And so the Prophet would pray an odd number of raka'at. And that's usually 11 or 13, basically, right? He would pray this quantity, and this is called witr, it is called tahajjud, it is called qiyamul layl, all of this is the same name. This he would never leave, sallallahu alayhi wa even in traveling. And Ibn Taymiyyah and others say that qiyamul layl was wajib upon the Prophet, sallallahu but not upon his ummah, right? Because Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ even though Allah says, نَافِلَةً لَكَ But when Allah commanded him, فَتَهَجَّدْ uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla says also in Surah Al-Mudathir that, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّ كَتُمُ أَدْنَى مِنْ ثُلُثَيْ لَيْلِ وَنِصْفَهُ وَثُلُثَهُ وَطَائِفَةُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَعَكَ That Allah knows that you're praying two-thirds of the night, ثُلُثَيْ اللَّيْ وَنِصْفَهُ and half of it وَثُلُثَهُ and a third of it So sometimes he would pray, so Allah says, two-thirds of the night, sometimes half of it, and sometimes one-third of it. So the Prophet would 
uh, differ in his uh, quantity of tahajjud depending on how long he slept and how what his uh, mood was basically for the time. But he would pray tahajjud every single night, even in traveling. These are the two types of uh, sunnah that he would pray. Now, apart from this, there's nafil. And nafil is unlimited in its scope. You may pray nafil at any time of the day and night, as long as it's not in the times of prohibition. That summarizes your question, inshallah. Okay, any questions about the seerah? Yes, in the back. Technically, Quba is the first masjid the Prophet built, but it can be said he did not witness its completion. Right? So the first masjid that he witnessed the completion and prayed in is his masjid. And that is why it is correct that the Rasul, of course, whatever he says is correct, he said, this is my masjid. Because there is a first element to both of them. Right? Quba was initiated, but the Medina masjid was completed. And he prayed there completed before he prayed in Quba completed. So both of them, uh, the verse applies to. Allahu alam. Other questions? Yes. Ammar bin Yasir, the Prophet, has prophesied how he's going to die. Yes. So, there's a fitna between Ummah and he's fighting in it on one side and the other side is So he drinks milk and go into into war although he knows the prophecy. <laughs> Did he know he would die in this battle? Well No he didn't. The prophecy says that, that it, it was you know a fair battle or we kill him after he drinks some milk. So he's, so he's gonna stop drinking milk for the rest of his life? I mean La, realistically speaking, firstly, these types of cryptic ahadith, they're typically only understood after the thing happens. You see what I'm saying here, right? These types of cryptic ahadith, one, it snaps into place after the thing happens, right? When the Prophet said it, what is being referred to? It's not something that people are understanding, right? So, uh, the fact that Ammar uh, an, eventually is killed on one side, then people are now reading back and saying, oh, the Prophet actually said this. Ammar participated in many ghazawat, in many wars. Between the Ammar died a very old man. When this hadith was said, he was in his 20s, right? 20s. And he died in his late 60s. You know, so... La, fi abaghia could have been, I'm saying could have been a kafir army. Yani, how do you know it's a fi'a baghiyad of a Muslim army? Now we know now it's a Muslim army. You say the word fi'a, it means... La, means a group. The same group, that's... La, fi'a means, yani, fi'a means group. Doesn't necessarily mean a Muslim group or a kafir group. Now it's easy in 2020, is, you know, hindsight is 2020 always, right? Now you look back and you say it's crystal clear. See, that's so, a that's been, you know, people talked about it. Either he went around saying, you know, the fi'a baghiyad is going to kill me and... No, he didn't narrate the hadith, by the way. He did not narrate the hadith. The Sahaba. So, as soon as he was killed, the Sahaba remembered this hadith and they interpreted it in this manner. It was a sign at the time of his death. But before his death, it was not understood what it was the reference. And by the way, this is, as I said, for all of the predictions uh, in this manner. In fact, even the predictions of the Qur'an. Right? Alif Lam Mim Ghulib Tirum Fi Adnan Ardi Wan Baghi Ghulib Sagalim Wan Fi Bidr Isanin. It was not understood how is this going to happen. What is it going to happen? But later, later on, it happened. Right? لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت وأنت حل بهذا البلد. When this ayah came down, uh, the Prophet was not free in this belad, but it's the prediction of the conquest of Mecca. Right? سيوه زم الجمع ويولون الدبر. Umar ibn Khattab said, Wallahi, I had no idea what this ayah meant until I saw on the day of Badr, Sayyuhzamul Jaru wa Yawaluna Dubur, and I knew that this was for the Battle of Badr. Right? It's cryptic, the Quran. Sayyuhzamul Jamr means the Confederates will be destroyed and they're gonna turn their backs and run away. Right? Umar ibn Khattab said, I had no idea what is this ayah talking about until I saw with my eyes what's happening on Badr and then I understood what is going on. So all of the, this is the beauty of Allah and His Messenger that the predictions are given in such a manner that it's not as explicit as to make it nonsensical. Right? There's a little bit of an element of surprise involved such that 
Uh, when it does happen, then everybody understands. But before it happens, it's best to be remain this way. Wallahu a'lam. Inshallah. Final question before we break for Salatul. Oh, we have some announcements. Yalla, okay. Bismillah, inshallah. We will see you, inshallah, the next, uh, next Wednesday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.